Okay, well, welcome everyone, all eight of you, ten of you. Um, welcome to the beginning of the material for exam three. Um, let's take a look at the syllabus. If you have your syllabus with you, let's take a look. And exam three is all about bones and muscles. And the good news about that is that that's the primary focus that you're dealing with right now as you think about the lab exam. So much of what I'll be saying over the next three lectures is some stuff that you have become somewhat familiar with as we looked at bone tissue and we looked at muscle a little bit and naming some bones and muscles. So if you take a look at the syllabus then, uh, exam two is over. Uh, here we are on Wednesday the 17th and I'll be talking um, about bone tissue. I'm a little bit off, but that's okay. Today we'll be talking about chapter uh, seven. Actually, it's, it's uh, chapter six, I think. And then in the bone. And then we're going to be talking about muscle and joints. Our next exam will be exam three. That'll be on Monday the 29th. And that will cover six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Now that sounds like a lot, but what it really is is three lectures. Okay, there's a lecture on bone. There's a lecture on joints, and there's a lecture on muscle. And uh, so it looks more scary than it is. Vocabulary on that exam will be 41 through 50. And that marks a halfway point. Right? Next week is week six. We have the lab exam next week, and then the lecture exam right after that. Right? So next week is the lab exam. That's our focus next week. The week after that will be this exam, number three. And um, that'll really kind of be right at the midpoint of the, of the semester. There's a, what else do I want to tell you about that? Typically, these two things have come in the same week. So during the regular fall or winter semester, the lab exam and this exam number three are in the same week. And this summer, I purposefully put them on different weeks so that you weren't having two tests in the same week. So let's get started with the skeletal system. And... Again, what I'll be talking to you about, a lot of it you know. I won't be saying, name this bone, name this bone. But any time that I see a bone marking, I'll quiz you on that because that's going to be important for you to become comfortable with that for the lab exam next week. So I'll quiz you as much as I can on these uh, concepts. And before we get too far, I should go back and take a look at the vocabulary. Uh, we're going to be going back to 41. And I think I'll do five slides today and five slides next time. And it's only, is that correct, 41 through 50? Is it right? It's only, uh, what does it say for exam four? I just want to make sure. Yep, yeah, okay, yep, yeah, so we're good. So 41 through 50. I'll do five today, five next time. We'll be ahead of the, ahead of the game for vocabulary. So holo, we saw holocrin, right? Holocrin secretion, where the whole or the entire cell disintegrated as part of it. That was in those sebaceous glands. Uh, homo and homeo, both mean same. Uh, homeo, though, we think about homeostasis. And when you think about homeostasis, certainly your blood pressure does not stay, quote, the same. Your uh, blood sugar does not stay the same. It stays in a similar range. So even though they both mean same, there is a slight difference. Homo meaning same. Homeo really meaning more similar, right? Really more similar. Uh, then hyalo, we've seen hyaline cartilage. We know that that's the glassy, clear, transparent cartilage that one finds at articulating surfaces. It's also the type of cartilage, remember, that makes up your skeleton as a fetus, and we'll be talking about some of that today. Hydro, water. That one's familiar. Hyper and hypo. These are two really commonly used terms. Hyper meaning above or over. Hypertrophy, we saw that term uh, when it dealt with tissues. Hypertrophy was when cells uh, grow what? More cells or grow bigger? Hyperplasia was... Division by mitosis, hypertrophy is the cells actually get bigger. Trophic meaning they kind of eat, right? They eat more, get bigger. Uh, hypo, under or below. Hypoglycemia would be a condition where sugar is low. And the emia, we know, means condition of the blood. So it's a condition of the blood where sugar is low. Uh, IA is an ending, some sort of state or condition. So hypoglycemia is a condition of 
low blood sugar. And then IATR is a root, meaning treatment. If you look at podiatry or psychiatry, you'll see that IATR as part of the word, or if it ends in iatrics, like pediatrics. Iasis, an abnormal condition, and there's iatry again. So iatrics, iatry, iatr. And ick, we had eel and al, and now we have ick. Those three all mean pertaining to. So isotonic, pertaining to, uh, something that's isotonic. Idio, uh, self or distinct. If you've been told that you have an idiopathic condition or an idiopathic disease, it means that your condition is so unique, so distinct, that really no one's quite sure what's going on. And um, usually that means time to go find another doctor, right? But if something is idiopathic, it's, it's unique to yourself or it's very distinct. If a term ends in IN, like hemoglobin, it is most oftentimes a protein. Now, that's not always true. Uh, collagen, the most abundant protein in the body, ends in EN. But many terms that end in IN are, in fact, proteins. Infra, below. You will see the infraspinatus muscle next semester, one of the rotator cuff muscles. And you can kind of tell me where that is. Infraspinatus, it must be where? Below the spine, right? And you know about the, sp the spine of the scapula. Inter, another very commonly used prefix meaning between. Intervertebral foramen, intervertebral disc, intercostal muscles. You'll see a lot of inter words. And we'll finish up with this today. Another very common one is intra. We've seen intracellular fluid. Iris, rainbow. What does the iris of your eye do? The iris is the colored muscle. So the blue, black, brown muscle of the eye is the iris. Ism, a state or condition. Isimus, the greatest. So we've seen the latissimus, right? The greatest, widest muscle of the back. And iso, meaning same or equal. This exam, not much vocabulary. It's only going to go through LUCO. Now, somebody tells me there's something different in your slides. Look over to your 50. Do you have LUCO or do you have something else there? What do you have at the end of 50? Let. We're going to go off your list, okay? So if I'm off by one slide or so, I'll go through your list of let, okay? So don't worry about LUCO. Okay, so that's the vocabulary. It'll go through let on the exam. And that now brings us back to the first of three presentations. So basically today, we'll talk about bones. Uh, then on next Monday, we'll talk about joints. And then next Wednesday, we'll talk about muscle. And then the following Monday, we'll have an exam. So we've got three lectures, um, three presentations, and that'll be the content for exam number three. How did exam number two go for you? It seemed to be a mixed bag. Um, some did pretty well. Uh, a number of students, I, I don't know, were, were we caught off guard? Um, did we just not study as much as we should have? Or maybe we were, I don't know. Maybe I want, I, I want to know. So maybe not now publicly. But if... if pretty specific. Yeah. I'm going to encourage you to go back and take a look at the exam. Um, we learn, we become better test takers by practicing. Not that this is a game, but you get better at taking exams by taking them, but also by going back and analyzing how you did. And every semester I'll have, you know, 60 to 150 students in biology 105, and usually only six or 10 will go back and look at their exams. I think it's an important thing to do. So up in the office, you can take a look at the test. You can look at the key. Make sure I didn't make any errors. I mean, there have been semesters where I have added up numbers incorrectly and given somebody the wrong num number. So you want to go up and check for that. But also just go through and ask yourself, did I just not read it right? Did I make a silly error? Did I not understand it? And by going through and thinking about how you did, spending 20 minutes or so, it usually will help you do even better on the next exam. So I really do encourage it. When you go up, um, the office is 1118. Hillary's there on Tuesday, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. And right now, with all the construction, the outside door to that area is closed. It may look like it's dark and closed, but she's in there 
Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, office hours, pretty much banking hours. So please go up there and take it. She has your exam. She has everything. And you can start looking at that tomorrow. Uh, let's talk about the skeletal system. Again, you have seen, been exposed to quite a bit of this. I have not been to this particular church in Prague, but it looks like an interesting place. During the, the plague years, they had so many dead bodies that they were using their bones in part to decorate and to build. So this church has, those are ribs hanging off the chandeliers, and you can see the skulls all along the, the, the walls. Pretty, pretty grotesque, but there they are still, you know, 300, 400 years later, proof that bones hang, hang around for quite a time. So the skeletal system. Again, when I first think of bones, I typically think of these sticks that hold to our muscles and somehow move our skeleton. But I think you're beginning to appreciate that there are a lot more than that. Bones are very dynamic, living systems. You can think of each bone as being an organ within the system of the skeletal system. Uh, if I had a bone in my hand, I would be able to find somewhere on that bone not only connective tissue, but also some muscle tissue. Remember that there are blood vessels traveling through bone, and the blood vessels themselves are lined by a little bit of smooth muscle. So I would find some muscle in a bone. I would find connective tissue. I'd find some nervous tissue. There's definitely nerves traveling through bone. And on the outside, in, in a freshly found bone, there'd be that layer of periosteum, and that periosteum would have some epithelial tissue in it, as well as there's always some endothelial cells, some epithelial cells lining the inside of your blood vessels. So you're going to find, just like we did with skin, right? If I take a chunk of skin, I can find epithelial, connective, muscle, and nervous. Same thing here with a bone. I can find pieces of those. Uh, bones are not just those isolated sticks. They are interacting with other systems. This is still a very active area of research. And we're now learning that bones send out signals. They send out hormone signals and chemical signals that interact with and influence other systems of the body. They are constantly, the bones are constantly rebuilding and remodeling themselves. We get that. We know that a young child, certainly their skeleton is changing. Through adulthood, those changes are minimal. But then as we get older, we start seeing some changes in our bones as well. Uh, the skeletal system is not only your 206 bones, but it's also the cartilage, the ligaments, and the connective tissues that stabilize or connect the bones together. So the cartilage, I'll be talking about bone and cartilage in this chapter, and the ligaments uh, that hold those bones together. Of course, the skeletal system is holding our weight, allows us to move, interacts with the muscles, and finally, don't forget that we're storing a lot of minerals. Calcium and phosphate are stored in high concentrations in the bone. The bone is largely made up of those calcium and phosphate molecules. And if you will see that calcium is necessary for a lot of things. Uh, as we go through this course, you're going to see that calcium is necessary. And there's a slide coming up on this in a moment. But calcium is necessary for your muscles to work. Calcium is necessary for your nerves to send signals. Calcium is necessary for your blood to clot. So we got to have calcium, but we need to have it at the right time and at the right place, and those, the bones are going to store it at like silos until we need it. And lastly, don't forget that inside the bones is where your blood cells are being produced. So that's a big connection to uh, the rest of your body. That process of making blood cells is hematopoiesis. You'll also see it written as hemopoiesis. Same thing, hemo or hematopoiesis. Uh, hemo blood. Poesis, formation of. So let's just go through the, the obvious things. We know that the bones protect and support. Clearly, the skull bones, uh, the cranial bones are protecting the brain. Clearly, the heart and lungs are protected by the ribs and the vertebra. We get this. The, the oscoxa is certainly protecting the reproductive organs. Movement, again, we get this one. We know that our muscles are attached to the bones, and together they allow us to move our skeleton. And inside that hemopoiesis process, the areas where you are still making blood, the areas where you still have active hemopoiesis, include the flat bones of your skull. Now, the flat bones, and I'll talk about flat bones in a few minutes, but your frontal bone is a flat bone. Not that, it, yes, it curves, 
but it, if you took your fingers and ran it on the inside and outside of the frontal bone, you would find that it's kind of a flat um, uh, orientation. So that you still have blood being made in your frontal bone, right? You still have blood being made in your vertebra, okay? You still have blood being made in your ribs, again, another flat bone. You still have blood being made in your sternum and hip bone, your co coccyx, as well as, we've seen this, the proximal end of the femur. If you look at that long bone anatomy, we saw a red bone marrow at the, at the proximal top. The rest of it was yellow bone marrow. And the same is true in your humerus. So up at the proximal end of your humerus, there is some red bone marrow. The rest of it would be yellow bone marrow. I alluded to this already. Uh, most of your calcium and phosphate are stored in your bones and are important in making your bones and released as needed under hormonal control. Without calcium, your muscles don't work. Without calcium, your nerves don't work. And phosphate, when you think of phosphate, I want you to think of ATP. All right, clearly, uh, ATP, the energy molecule of your body, uh, is very plentiful, and we see that phosphate. What else in our body is made of phosphate have we talked about? What else? Phosphophosphate has come up a couple more times. Phospholipids, absolutely. So all of your cell membranes have phosphate in their lipid membranes. And DNA and RNA have a phosphate sugar, phosphate sugar backbone. So we've seen a lot of phosphate, very important molecules. The problem with, with calcium and phosphate, when they're together in high concentration, they make bone. So you never want to have calcium and phosphate in your blood at the same time in higher concentrations because basically, like an oyster, it makes a pearl. This is the basis of kidney stones and liver stones and even the basis of atherosclerosis, the, the crunchiness of the arteries, that buildup of plaque. Some of it is a calcium phosphate kind of crunchy stuff. So you never want to have too much calcium and phosphate in the blood at the same time. And we'll, we'll allude to that a couple times throughout the semester. So it's stored in bone as bone, right? And released as needed. And we'll talk about how that is controlled. So let's start off with cartilage, OK? So the skeletal system is not just bone, but also cartilage. Uh, we, know this, we know most of this story, although there's one new fact here. Cartilage is made by cells called chondroblasts. Now, we talked about chondrocytes before, OK? Chondroblast. What does blast mean? To bud or to germinate. What did we see in connective tissue? We saw fibroblasts. And what were those fibroblasts making? The proteins, right? They were making the collagen proteins, and they were making the, the elastic proteins, right? So blast blasts make things. Blast means to germinate or bud or to make things. So cartilage is made by chondroblasts. Once that cartilage is made, those cells kind of get surrounded in their little lacuna structure. And now they're not as actively producing new cartilage. So now we change their name to chondrocytes. So chondrocytes are mature cartilage cells stuck in their lacuna with immature cartilage. But the cells that actually made the cartilage are the chondroblasts. They're the same cell, <laughs> OK? The chondroblast becomes the chondrocyte, OK? It's just a timing and a placement difference. We know that cartilage, once formed, is avascular. So once cartilage is in place, it's an avascular tissue. That's why cartilage is so white. So if you look at, if you're at B-dubs, you're eating some chicken wings, right, and you look at the end of that little white ball that pops out, that little white ball is cartilage. It's pure white. There's no blood flow pure, pure white. If you look at all the models in the room, you'll see that on the models, tendons are almost also avascular. And so you'll see a lot of white things uh, referring to avascular structures. Now, the cartilage is doing three things. Uh, it is supporting soft tissues. It is creating the gliding surface for your joint spaces. Those are called the articulations. Where two bones come together, most of them move, don't they? Not all of them. 
We know we've seen fibrous joints and we saw cartilaginous joints, but most of your joints are synovial joints, meaning they move, they glide, they slide, and the cartilage is creating a nice, smooth, gliding surface on the end of the bones for that surface to move. Now, what happens with time, with age? That smooth cartilage can start to get chunky and break down. And now we've got arthritis, right? We've got inflammation of the joints. And once that cartilage is gone, it doesn't replace itself. It is avascular. It doesn't have nutrients going to it, nor the ability to regenerate. So once you lose cartilage, it's gone. There are some supplements. People take chondroitin sulfate. People take other joint supplements to try to slow down or maintain their joints. But there's very little evidence that those help rebuild. They simply hold on to what's there and keep it stronger and more healthy. But very little evidence that cartilage regenerates in any way. Maybe someday. And then finally, as I've alluded to, your skeleton was largely cartilage before it, quote, ossified, before it became bone, it was first cartilage. So those are the three big functions of cartilage. Now, these three terms, I think, are also familiar to you. A tendon. We saw them in the lab on the models. Tendons are what connect a bone to a muscle or a muscle to a bone. Ligaments, same stuff. Under the microscope, dense regular connective tissue. It's the same stuff. But if it connects a bone to a bone, it's instead called a ligament. And sometimes this stuff isn't like a long white cord. It is more of a flattened surface. And then it's called an aponeurosis. And an aponeurosis is a chunk of cartilage, or sorry, a chunk of um, dense regular connective tissue that connects muscle to muscle. There were two aponeuroses in the lab. I think I showed them to all the labs, and I'm starting to think maybe I didn't do it on Monday morning. Across the abdominal area, there's a big white sheet on the model. That is an aponeurosis. It's connecting the abdominal muscles to other abdominal muscles. No, no bones here. And then across the top of the skull, there is an aponeurosis that connects the muscles that are attached around the skull. So you see two big white sheets. So those are aponeuroses. Now bones, let's go back to bone. Uh, bone. Bones come in four basic shapes. In lab, we spent the most time describing long bones. We used the femur as the example. We talked about epiphysis and diaphysis. We, we mentioned the nutrient foramina. You've seen those long bones. Every one of the long bones in your body is in your appendicular skeleton, right? They're all in your arms or legs. In addition to long bones, there are bones called short bones. They're really not any different, except they're not long. They're kind of more cuboid shaped. This is going to include your carpals, the eight bones in your wrist. This is going to include the bones of your ankle, the tarsals. This even includes the patella, right? Little kind of chicken nugget bone, kind of a short cubic shaped bone. There are flat bones. They have a different architecture to them. And I'll show you a couple of slides how they're different from the long bone. Uh, this is going to include sternum and ribs, and even the frontal bone and the parietal bone are considered flat bones. Then finally, there's a garbage pail of everything else. And this is going to be the irregular bones. This is going to include your vertebra. They're kind of funky in shape. It's going to include the ethmoid, the sphenoid. It's also going to include the vomer. Some of those weirdly shaped bones that are very unique are going to be in this category just called irregular bones. So where do we find these? Uh, Let's, let's talk about this. What bone do we see on the left of this image? It's a long bone. It's a long bone. What's the name of that bone on the left? Femur. There were one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight things you need to know on the femur. I'm going to point, and you tell me what they are, okay? Number one. The head of the femur. The neck of the femur, greater trochanter of the femur, lesser trochanter. Now, it's hard to see it, but on the back side here, what would that be? The big rounded knob on the back side of the femur would be the condyle. condyle. Which one? 
medial condyle because it's on the inside. You know you're on the inside because it's where the head fits into the os coxa. And on the back side over here would be the lateral, lateral condyle. Now, there are also epicondyles. This isn't the best place to see those. Epicondyles are little bumps on the side of the condyles. So I'll find a better show, picture of that in a minute. So clearly, this is a long bone. Short bones would include the little foot bones, the tarsal bones. It would also include the patella. Your flat bones, ribs, sternum, and even the frontal bone. And then your regulars like vertebra, um, some of the facial bones, the sphenoid, ethmoid, etc. Now here is a diagram, all but one thing you've already been introduced to. What bone is this? What bone is this? It's a long bone. In lab, the anatomy of the long bone was done with a femur. Here, this is the humerus, right? We still see the little ball on the top. We still see cartilage at the top. There were one, two things at the distal end of this bone you need to know. What are they? What's this little round part right here called? It articulates with the radius. That is the capitulum, capitulum. And this portion articulates with the ona, specifically with the trochlear notch of the ulna, that little area is called the trochlea. Okay, so the trochlea and the capitulum on the distal end of the humerus. Now, everything else on here is pretty familiar. On a long bone, same, same anatomy everywhere. If this were a rather fresh bone, I would see a layer on the outside. That's called the periosteum. There'd be some blood vessels in there, some connective tissue, some epithelial tissue. There's gonna be some blood vessels coming in and out of the bone. Those are passing through openings called nutrient foramen or foramina. The bone needs to get oxygen and blood. It also needs to get those newly made cells out. So there has to be a communication way in and out of the bone. The shaft of the bone is the diaphysis. The two ends of the bone, the epiphysis, more completely, this one would be the proximal epiphysis on the distal end, the distal epiphysis. Again, we only see the white cartilage where the bone would be articulating, so I see it up here at the head. What does the head of the humerus articulate with? What bone? The scapula, specifically into what structure? Glenoid cavity. Then you also see the cartilage down here at the distal end where it articulates with the radius and the ulna. I do see here an epiphyseal line. What does that line tell me? Girl. That line tells me that this bone has already matured. matured. It has already reached its adult and final length. If this were a child's bone, it would not have a line, but there would be a gap, a spacer. And I'll show that to you, uh, the epiphyseal plate or the growth plate that would be present in a growing bone. On the very inside, I know you've seen this term in your labeling. The outside has a periosteum, right? Peri around. The inside, between the compact bone and the spongy bone, is a layer called the endosteum. Okay? The endosteum. And the endosteum, endoosteum, within the bone. So that is the layer between the compact bone and the inner spongy bone. Most of the diaphysis will be filled with yellow bone marrow, okay, kind of a yellow fat colored stuff. It doesn't really show that too much here. And up at the proximal head, what will we find in here? Red bone marrow, right? So that would be where there'd be active hematopoiesis. What's brand new on this image that you have not seen before? is a structure called the metaphysis. So you've already seen the diaphysis, you've seen the epiphysis, you've seen um, those terms, but metaphysis, metaphysis. And this is basically, I'm gonna clear this off, this is 
basically where the epiphyseal plate is, the epiphyseal line. So right up here is the metaphysis. Okay, and there's also one down here. So if you could dive into that bone, you would see that's where the epiphyseal line is. That's where the growth plate would have been, okay, in a developing bone. That's in the metaphysis. So the metaphysis is the area that contains the epiphyseal growth plate that becomes the line in an adult bone. Let's dive in a little bit. We're still looking at the humerus. I know that because I see this nice rounded head, but it doesn't protrude out like the femur does. Okay, so that's the humerus. And again, we're gonna be looking at the outer and inner layers. We're taking a little box right here. We're gonna zoom in. At the outer layer, we're looking at the periosteum, the very outer layer of the bone. You can see the periosteum is kind of being peeled off here in this image. And that would be some connective tissue. I'm not going to focus too much on the periosteum. But what do we see in here? It looks like our birthday cake model in the lab. It looks like some ants, doesn't it? Some sort of bugs. Now, we know what those bugs are. The, the, the body of the bug would be the bone cell, the osteocyte, in a space called a lacuna. And the little legs of the bug represent the canaliculi. We've seen that. We know that. And we know that bone is arranged in layers. See the layers? And those layers are each called a lamella. So we've seen that story. That's not new. Then let's zoom into this little box here and go. Now we're at the border of the compact bone on the outside and the spongy bone deep on the inside. And here we also see there's our little osteocyte living in a lacuna. There's actually four kinds of cells here. And let me introduce these cells to you. We know osteocyte. That's the only one we talked about. Osteocytes, osteocytes, osteocytes. Osteocytes live where? They're found inside the lacuna. They are in mature bone. Just like chondrocytes were found in cartilage, osteocytes are found in bone. What kind of cell made the bone? Use the same analogy. Chondroblasts made the cartilage. Osteoblasts are going to make the bone. Okay. So we're going to find that around the outside edge, where bone grows, there are going to be osteoblasts. Blast, build. Right? These cells are building bone. There's also, and then those are what building, and then what do we find inside? Inside the lacuna, osteocytes. There's another cell here called an osteoclast. I'll come back to it in a minute. Clast, we know from our vocabulary, means what? Breakdown. So osteoclasts are cells that are going to be actively doing what? Breaking down bone. Whereas osteoblasts, are the cells that are going to be actively building it. B for build and C for chew. Okay? And the osteocytes are the cells that are hanging out in the made bone. So let's try to figure these cells out. Here's the list of these cells. It's all here for you. Again, the cells that we know and love, the ones we've labeled before, are the osteocytes. They're the ones living in the mature cell in the lacuna. Where do the osteocytes came from? come from? They were once osteoblasts that made the bone, that surrounded that cell and cocooned itself in this bony matrix. Those are the osteoblasts, the actively building bone cells. Where did those cells come from? Osteoblasts came from stem cells in the bone. Now these osteoprogenitor cells aren't very busy until you break a bone. And when you break a bone, suddenly these cells go into overdrive and they now create the, the, the new cells that can repair the bone. Skin's the same way, right? You've got stem cells deep in your skin. They don't do a whole lot until you cut yourself. And all of a sudden, those cells go into overdrive, replacing re damaged cells. So these osteoprogenitor cells are truly the stem cells, the cells that will become osteoblasts and then will become osteocytes. They are derived from 
mesoderm. I know it says mesenchyme. It's the same thing. It's another word for it. Remember we talked about this last time. That bone and connective tissues, all of them come from the mesoderm. So those three cell types are connected. Osteoprogenitors become osteoblasts. Osteoblasts make the bone. Osteoblasts, once they make the bone, go into semi-retirement, living in the retirement home called lacuna, and we call them now osteocytes. The other cell type is completely separate. It's a different kind of cell altogether. That's on the bottom, osteoclast. They are truly a different derivation. They are phagocytic. They are, you know, they chop up things. Um, they are very, very large cells. I'll show you a comparison of their size in a moment. And they are multinucleated. This is now the second cell type we've seen that are multinucleated. What was the other type of cell that was multinucleated? We talked about it in lab this week. Skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle, long, long cells made up of multinucleated cells. So we've got skeletal muscle cells are multinucleated and osteoclasts are multinucleated. They also dissolve bone. They break it down, clast. They break it down. And they do so by releasing hydrochloric acid. So they release acid in a very localized area. That acid eats away at the calcium. We talked about this last week in lab. Remember I talked about if you took a bone and you put it in acid, what happens to it? The calcium mineral stuff dissolves away. It's the same thing that osteoclasts do. They release some acid in a localized area, and now that breaks down the bone. And when the bone breaks down, what's being released? Calcium and phosphate. So the calcium and phosphate is released into the body to be used as needed. These two cells, osteoclasts and osteoblasts, are constantly working together. Right? They're working together throughout your life. As a child, osteoblasts are definitely winning the game. But the osteoclasts are important in shaping your bones. I mean, why does your femur have the shape that it does? Why does the vomer have the shape it does? Because the osteoclasts kind of know where to chew away and carve out and create the unique shape of all of your bones. It's a pretty neat process. Then as we are adults, the osteoclasts, osteoblasts are kind of balanced. They, they have a balancing act going on. And then as we get older, the osteoblasts kind of get pooped out. They stop making bone as effectively, but the osteoclasts gain new power. And our bones continue to be broken down more than they are built. And this can start leading to osteoporosis and other bone disorders. Here's a comparison of these. On the bottom, this is a different staining view than what you've seen. I'm not going to hold you responsible for recognizing this type of stain. But on the bottom, these are the little osteoblasts, OK? And what you'll see is that the osteoblasts are along the border, right? They're where the bone is being built. Up here, we have an osteocyte. It's living in that space called a lacuna. And look at this big old osteoclast. It is huge in its comparison. Very, very, very large. On the top is a cartoon of an osteoclast. So let's take a look. This cell, huge. And notice that it has many nuclei in there. You see dark, a lot of dark nuclei. It also is very large. Look at its size in comparison to there's a little osteocyte, a little osteocyte, a little osteocyte, and then this huge osteoclast. Okay. So a big, big, multinucleated, acid-producing, phagocytic cell. Chews away at the bone. The next time you see this picture, these will still be osteoclasts. Okay. Now, these cells, I don't know why, every semester someone says that's a neuron. Now, I get it, but are we talking about neurons right now? No? no? So on the test, when you see that picture again, it will still be an osteoclast, I assure you. Okay. You see about three or four of those cells. And again, you, you can't really tell how big they are, but you can see that they have all these uh, branches coming out, and they are definitely releasing acid. OK, so I've talked about 
long bones, short bones, really nothing special about them. They're just short, squatty bones. Flat bones, though, have a rather unique architectural structure to them, a little bit different. They don't have metaphysis and epiphysis like a long bone, but they have two layers of compact bone, sandwiching in between them a layer of spongy bone. That spongy bone on the inside has a unique name called diploi. Okay. So you've got two layers of compact bone. It's like an Oreo cookie. The compact bone are the chocolate wafers, and the, the meaty, the, the white stuff is the diploi, the spongy bone. There is no endosteum. That's kind of a unique thing. So there is periosteum on both sides, but there's no endosteum. Let's take a picture of it. So here we're looking at a little chunk of what bone? What bone is that? Parietal, right? The parietal bone, we're taking a little chunk of it, and we're blowing it up. And if I took a little chunk of your parietal bone down here, those are the outer layers that can protect the brain. And what I see is one layer of compact bone and one layer of compact bone in between a layer of spongy bone. So that's the architecture of flat bones. On the outside and on the inside, there's a layer of periosteum. Here you see it being lifted. And on the bottom, there's also a layer of periosteum. Just a little different. No metaphysis, no diaphysis, but two layers of compact bone with a layer of spongy bone in between. And these bones are largely hematopoietic. Doesn't say that here, but your flat bones, your parietal bone, your frontal bone, your sternum, your ribs, they have this architecture, and that middle spongy bone is quite hematopoietic. A lot of blood production occurring there. This slide should be very comfortable for you. We're looking at what bone, compact bone, looks like under the microscope. And you've been quizzed on this like it seems like forever, right? Two labs in a row. We've talked about osteons and central canals, the lamella that make up the layers, the lacuna with the osteocytes and the canaliculi. Here on the top is an electron microscope image. And so I think it shows a nice view. You can actually see the divots, right, that create the lacuna, and you can appreciate the three-dimensionality of the central canal. So I kind of like that view, just as a different view. Under the microscope, you see what's on the bottom left. That is more of a flat, two-dimensional view of bone. Is everyone okay with this story? I think we're probably okay with these. It's the same six things. The seventh thing is listed. Can I see a Volkmann's canal on this image? No. Remember, Volkmann canals would only be visible on a three-dimensional model of the bone. And they are also called the perpendicular canals. They're the ones that go between the central canals. You can see the Volkmann canals here, though, in this cartoon representation of bone. This is sort of like a label, something you saw labeled in the Amerman. It's something you did in the pre-labs. Uh, you saw that it looks like the birthday cake model in the lab itself. Again, I'm going, to, I'm going to scribble on something. You tell me what I'm scribbling on. This layer out here is the, what's peeling off, periosteum. is the periosteum. And in this area, where the bone, the compact bone and the spongy bone are meeting, I could also call that the endosteum. Right? The endosteum is that layer where those two meet on the inside. What is this? That canal? That's the Volkmann's canal. And it's connecting what? One central canal to another central canal. Those central canals have red, blue, and yellow arteries, veins, and nerves traveling through them. On the outside, or sorry, on the inside edge, I see that different arrangement. That's what spongy bone looks like, and that is referred to as trabeculae. Trabeculae is just the name given to that spongy, mazy look of spongy bone. So I've told you that bone is, in your, in your body, most of your skeleton was first cartilage. And then that cartilage became bone. The process of making bone is ossification, right? Making bone, the process of ossification. There's two basic types of ossification. 
intramembranous. Break it down. Intra within a membrane. Uh, this is how your flat bones are made. Okay. So your cranial bones, your flat bones, your ribs, your sternum are made by intramembranous. That's not where I'm going to focus today. I'm instead going to talk more about endochondral ossification. And as that name suggests, you see the term chondro in there. This is bone that was first cartilage, chondro. So this is how most of your long bones and your short bones and your irregular bones are produced. Then bones, we know, grow in two different ways. They grow bigger in diameter and they grow longer in length. Does that make sense? Right? We all know every bone gets bigger around from a child to an adult and every bone gets longer in its length. The increase in the diameter of a bone is specifically called appositional bone or appositional growth. And this is form, I mean, bones get bigger around by making more lamella, by making more of those layers. That's why I think when you look at a bone and you see a, a tree ring, it, it, it's kind of the right, it's, it's a good analogy because bones get bigger around with lamella and trees get bigger around with those annual growth rings. Then the lengthening of bones also is through endochondrial growth. That word is used twice here. Endochondrial is used to describe bones forming from cartilage. It's also used to describe the lengthening of bones because, as we'll see, bones grow longer because of cartilage first. So look at this series of images from left to right. On the lower left is an infant's bone. It says it's a femur. And as we move up, child, young adult, and older adult. What do you notice about these sections? We're taking transverse sections through the bone. I notice a couple things happening through time. Say it again. Yeah, the diameter is certainly increasing, right? The bone's getting bigger around. Not only is the bone getting bigger around, but look at the thickness. Look at the thickness of the compact bone, right? It's thicker itself, isn't it? So we see that, yes, the whole bone is getting bigger in diameter, but also the thickness of the compact bone is increasing through more lamellae, through more of these rings, these uh, uh, layers produced. Where is this change occurring? At the edges. Bone is going to grow at the periosteal edge and at the endosteal edge. It's going to grow at the two edges. That's where osteoblasts hang out. So osteoblasts are going to be on the outside and the inside. Remember, osteoblasts are not sitting in the middle of the compact bone, right? In the middle of the compact bone, you get those cells in semi-retirement, the osteocytes. They're not building anymore. They're just hanging out. So you're only going to see active bone growth from the inside and outside edge. The term for this, uh, the term for this is oops, deposition. When you are making more bone, we see that bone is being deposited or deposition is occurring. It's like you're going to the bank to make a deposit. You're putting more money in, you're building it up. When the bone is broken down and uh, calcium is released, we call that resorption, resorption. So what cells are responsible for deposition? Osteoblasts. What cells are responsible for resorption? Osteoclasts, C. So let's go through this process. Endochondrial ossification. Bone becoming bone, but was first cartilage. The type of cartilage, as we know, is hyaline cartilage. What else do we know about cartilage? That it is avascular. So bone was first an avascular chunk of cartilage. And here's how it happens. On the left, that is a chunk of cartilage. It kind of looks bone-like. Notice that it's solid blue. There is no blood vessels in this image. If I could look at the cells there, I would see chondrocytes and chondroblasts. It is purely cartilage. Around the outside edge, would be a layer called the perichondrium, the outer edge of the 
cartilage is perichondrium. During development, blood vessels start kind of knocking on the outside door of that chunk of cartilage. And it starts knocking on the door along what will become the diaphysis. That blood vessel is going to penetrate into the diaphysis. With that blood comes oxygen. And with that oxygen, the osteo, sorry, the chondrocytes will become osteocytes. Okay, so it's with the deliverance of oxygen and some other growth factors and other chemicals that the cartilage will begin to ossify to become bone. It starts in the center. So we refer to that center area as the primary ossification center. So we see that, I mean, here in this image, these are still chondrocytes, right? This is still cartilage, little eyeballs looking at you. But once those blood vessels penetrate in, now these cells in here have become bone-like. So we call that the primary ossification center. After the diaphysis receives blood, now look where capillaries and blood flow goes next, to the two ends, to the epiphyses. And the ends of the bone will also, be, or the ends will also become bone. But notice there's still an area, I'm going to change colors, there's still an area in the green box that does not have blood flow and is still regular old cartilage. That is the epiphyseal growth plate. And it's there that cartilage will stay all the way through the bone's life and development until the bone reaches its adult length. Then those cartilage cells will die off, that growth plate will fuse and create the epiphyseal line. So going to the next slide, we see the natural progression of this. Again, the two ends, the two ends have blood, right? They are bone. The middle is bone. But there's still that area right in the middle where I've got the green boxes now where you have the epiphyseal plate. That's what you would see in a young child's bone, long bone. Those chondrocytes are going to continue, and chondroblasts are going to continue to divide and lengthen, and that's going to lengthen the bone from its two ends. At some point, hormonal signals will come in, and that epiphyseal plate will close, and what will be left is what we've seen before, and that is the epiphyseal line. Okay. That line, no more cartilage, and if you look at it, there's blood flow now going straight through. So there's no longer a barrier where there's no blood flow. So that whole process, endochondral ossification, ossifying from within on endo, cartilage, chondro. Look at these little feet. This is, I think this is a cool series of images. So on the far left is a nine-month-old baby's foot. Look at the bones. They're not anywhere near touching each other, right? Is it any wonder why we can squeeze kids' feet into little tiny shoes, right? They, don't, they just kind of wiggle. They don't really resist much, do they? So as we move two years, three years, five years, notice that the metatarsals are getting longer. And the, even the little, look at all these little bones. All these are the tarsals, right? They're not even touching each other. They're all just kind of hanging out in there. The ankle, and one of the kids can't walk, right? They have no bone structure in their feet. Now, look at these images. And there's a couple places where this is really obvious. Look right here. It looks like there's, or look right here. It looks like there's a big gap between the bones. That gap is the growth plate. So you're seeing the evidence that this bone has not yet reached its adult length, and we see over time that lengthening is occurring. Okay. Now take that same foot, and now let's take a look at an adult. All the bones have elongated and are now articulating one with another. Now when you look, it's 
hard to see the epiphyseal lines. But now what I'm looking at, that is the joint space. You want that joint space to be nice and regular and smooth. If you look at an x-ray and you notice that that space is kind of whitish or has a bunch of junk in there, that would be some calcification and some breakdown of the cartilage. And that would suggest that person's having arthritic changes. They may not have pain yet, but it's coming. There's going to be at some point where bone's going to start rubbing on bone and being really inflamed. So when you look at this, I don't really see, although if you look closely, I can see what appears to be epiphyseal lines in some of these places. You kind of have to use your imagination a little bit. But you'll see what looks like an epiphyseal line. Here's one perhaps right here. Okay, where I can see sort of a line going across. But the space you're seeing there is the actual joint space. So not to belabor this, but what bone are we looking at here? Femur. And on the right is a young femur, young child, and on the left is the adult femur. And even here, you can see that there's a gap, right, between the head and the rest and the neck of the femur. And you can even see that there's a gap at the greater trochanter, right? That gap is not a defect. That gap is a growth plate. And there would be growth changes occurring. But as an adult, that has fused together. And on the x-ray, you would see the line. Now, this fusion happens at different ages depending upon the bone. Somewhere between the ages of 10 and 25, your bones will be completely ossified and all the growth plates will seal. A forensic anthropologist or forensic scientist can look at a skeleton and look at which bones have epiphyseal plates, which ones have epiphyseal lines, and make an approximate age at the time of death for a young skeleton based upon the combination of those growth plates, the presence and absence of those. Uh, guys tend to grow a little longer than women, right? Longer in time. So women's plates are going to close sooner than guys. And we'll talk a little bit about why that is. Questions? How are we doing? Reasonable? So we've already said that bone is constantly changing. It's, there's constant resorption and constant deposition, back and forth, back and forth. Again, deposition is being done primarily by what cells? Osteoblasts. And the resorption is primarily being done by osteoclasts. Roughly 20% of your skeleton is being replaced every year. So the way of thinking about it, every five years, you get a whole brand new set of skeleton, right? a whole new set of bones. Every five years or so, on average, your bone has been completely replaced and resurfaced and, and is all different from what it was before that. Again, all the changes in your bone is primarily happening at the periosteal and the endosteal surfaces where the osteoclasts and the osteoblasts hang out. They hang out on the edges. Now, what is it that influences bone growth? There is a hormone produced by the pituitary gland called growth hormone. And that growth hormone does, it does stay rather high during, young, during the young years. And it does decline after puberty. This hormone does stimulate epiphyseal plate. So it does encourage lengthening of bones. Now, this hormone can go out of control, though. If you've watched any of the TLC shows with the Chinese giants, right, the 7 foot 11 guy in China, he has a pituitary gland tumor. And that tumor is still producing growth hormone at re unreasonable high rates. And his epiphyseal lines, his epiphyseal plates are still there. So he's continuing to grow and continuing to grow, right? And as long as that growth hormone's out of control. Now, the pituitary gland hangs down from the brain. And it's protected by what bony structure of the sphenoid? Little saddle-shaped structure, the Turkish saddle, the cella turcica. P. 
people who have a pituitary tumor, sometimes they just can't get to it, right? And they, it, would, it might kill the patient to get to the tumor. So in this particular special that I'm thinking about, this guy's seven foot 11, he's still growing. His cardiovascular system is struggling to keep up with pumping blood up and down almost eight feet. And these guys usually die rather young because of cardiovascular issues. The, the heart just isn't designed to pump blood eight feet up and down. And that's why taller guys, honestly, don't live as long on average than shorter guys, right? You go to nursing homes, not a lot of t tall dudes there, right? It's usually little guys uh, because tight does challenge the cardiovascular system. So growth hormone definitely stimulates epiphyseal plate, makes bones grow longer. Number two, though, are sex hormones. Now, everyone remembers back to middle school, right? And about that time, usually the girls kind of sometimes are taller than the guys. And then all of a sudden, the girls stop growing, the guys start taking off. The reason is women usually reach their puberty years earlier, and the growth hormone surge shoots them over the guys for a couple of years, maybe, in middle school. But then they stop growing whereas guys then kind of mature a little bit later and keep on going. And here's why. Estrogen, one of the main hormones produced by women beginning higher levels at puberty, actually encourages the closing of growth plates. So once a woman reaches menst menstruation age, typically she's gonna stop growing within 18 months. If you think back, ladies, from the time of menses, the onset of menses, you were at your adult height probably within 18 to 24 months of that moment in your life. That estrogen surge causes your bones to close and slow down. There's a few exceptions, but that's the general rule. Whereas testosterone, which starts getting kicked out in high amounts with male puberty, continues to encourage lengthening of bones. So the guys don't have the estrogen surge, but they have that testosterone surge. This is why there's some concern by athletes about taking soy supplements, right? Soy milk and soy products have natural estrogens in them. And there's some concern, right, that the increased soy diet that we're consuming in this country is perhaps causing a little bit of shortening of guys. Now, I don't know how valid that is, People will say, well, look at the Asian populations. They have a large soy diet, and they're a little bit shorter. Is the connection there completely black and white? I don't know. I think it does contribute to it, though. And um, if you look at Asians who are no longer eating more of a traditional Asian diet but are eating more of a Western diet, less soy, they're tending to grow a little bit taller. So there might be a connection there, and it's one of the reasons why my son's coaches are saying, if you're going to you know, have a, a protein shake, make it whey protein and not soy protein. We want to avoid those, est those plant estrogens that are part of soy because they could have a little bit of, a, of an effect on his growing taller if it's in his genes. Who knows, right? But one thing to be thinking about. Other thing that it contributes to bones and bone growth and bone strengthening are vitamins. Um, in our milk, right, our milk is A and D uh, uh, fortified. So vitamin A, we know, is important for activating osteoblasts. Osteoblasts, we know, are the building cells. Vitamin C is also important for collagen. Uh, so it used to be in the old days, when people were on a ship over the ocean, they would be vitamin C deficient, right? Citrus can't last for months on a ship. And so people would be vitamin C deficient, and they would get a condition called scurvy. And one of the things that scurvy does is it damages the bones uh, because the collagen cannot maintain itself. So vitamin C is necessary for collagen to be produced. Vitamin D is important for uh, encouraging the absorption and transport of calcium through your body. So our milk is vitamin D and calcium enriched, right? So they work hand in hand. Calcium without D and D without calcium they're not working as synergistically as best they could if they're not coming in together. Exercise also has a very important effect on bone. Bones require mechanical stress to stay normal and to remodel normally. A person who's not putting mechanical stress on their bones and 
you know, using their muscles to pull on them will actually have some issues with their bone strength. One of the best things that anyone can do for their bone mass is to do some light exercise. So if grandma's got some sort of osteoporosis issue, the best thing she can do is walk and do light exercises, just two pound, five pound dumbbells, just those stretch bands, anything to help keep stress on the bones will help keep them healthier and stronger. And those who don't do those weight bearing activities will continue to lose bone mass. So just, it doesn't have to be great, ex, great weights, but just a little bit of weight will go a long way in keeping those bones really, really healthy. So again, if you don't do that, you start losing what's called demineralization. That is, you're going to start losing the calcium and phosphate. That's going to make the bones more porous, osteoporosis, and will also lead to collagen uh, issues. There are two hormones that I want to introduce to you. Uh, these, are the first, these are the first hormones we've talked about. Um, this is more of a flavor for what we'll be doing a lot of in Biology 106. There we'll talk a lot about hormones and how they work in our body. These two hormones are involved with bone remodeling, so I want to talk about them. And they center around calcium homeostasis. You want to keep your calcium levels in your blood at a relatively normal range, just like everything else, blood you know, glucose or body temperature or respiration rate. If your calcium levels of the blood start to drop down, then there are cells in your throat, part of a gland called the parathyroid gland. And those cells of, the, of that gland are looking for low calcium. When there's low calcium, that gland will make parathyroid hormone, PTH, parathyroid hormone. And the purpose of that parathyroid hormone is to bring the levels of calcium back up. Now, if you were the grand engineer of your body, how would you raise your calcium levels back up? Tell me some things you would do. My calcium levels are low. Parathyroid sends out the signal, says, whoa, 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 your calcium's getting too low. That signal's gonna go throughout your blood to your tissues through hormone called PTH and do what? Say it again. Go to the bones and tell the bones to do what? Make, I want calcium. So I'm going to tell my osteoclasts to start chewing. And those osteoclasts, as they chew, are going to start releasing calcium. What else am I going to do? I'm going to go to my kidneys and say, when calcium comes by, keep it. Don't let it stay in the urine. So get that calcium back in the body. I'm going to go to my skin, and I'm going to say, you know what? Remember that story? There's a slight connection between vitamin D that we make through sunlight, through our skin, and the absorption of calcium. So your skin's actually going to make more vitamin D, trying to get more calcium absorbed. And it's going to also, this hormone is going to go to your gut and tell your epithelium of your small intestine to absorb more calcium when it comes through the gut. So that one hormone does a number of things, all of which are designed to do what? Bring your calcium levels back up. But I told you, you don't want too much calcium in your blood because that is also a problem. So there's another hormone called calcitonin. Okay, so let me go back. Uh, everything I've just said is here, right? This is all about parathyroid. So this is what parathyroid does. It raises your calcium levels back up when they're too low, and I told you the four things it does. The other hormone is calcitonin, and that's written here somewhere in smaller words. Where did it go? I guess I'll write it. There it is. Okay. So calcitonin is a hormone produced by the thyroid gland when calcium is too high. Just reverse it all. So when calcium is too high, it releases calcitonin, the thyroid gland does, and does what? What does that calcitonin tell the body to do? It does all the opposite. So it's going to turn on what cells? We want, to, we want to take the extra calcium and get rid of it or use it, so we're going to turn on the osteoblast, saying, hey, go ahead and make up some bone, store that calcium. We're going to tell the kidneys, let it go, let it flow. We're going to tell the gut, 
don't need it right now. No, thank you. Let it keep going through the, through the digestive system. And we're going to tell the skin, eh, you can cool off on the vitamin D a little bit. So again, it does all the opposite effects. And this flow chart is just that. It just tells you what I just told you in words and shows you this sort of this yin-yang relationship between calcitonin and parathyroid hormone. Really interesting story. And we'll talk a lot about those hormone relationships in 106 next semester. Now, you know that if you break your bone, they, break, they, they heal, right? They heal. Um, and bones heal rather naturally. If you break a bone and it's at a funky angle, it will connect back and heal at that same funky angle. Really what orthopedic surgeons are there to do is to realign the bones, put pins and screws in there, and cast it so that the bones can do what they naturally do. That is, find the two broken pieces and heal. When a bone is broken, imagine like a femur or a tibia or fibula. When that bone snaps, there are some steps that happen. Number one, it's a big bloody mess, right? So there's going to be a blood clot that forms. That's called a hematoma. Hema, hemato, blood. Oma, tumor-like or mass. A big mass of blood because you know there's a lot of blood in your bones. Now, once that blood stops flowing, then the osteoclasts, which are hanging out, are going to come in and start being like the garbage men. And they're going to come in and clean up all the fragments and get rid of that blood clot, that hematoma, and kind of just clean up the room. And then those osteoblasts are going to be turned on by the progenitor cells, and they're going to start building bone rather prolifically. And the bone will just naturally start to knit itself together and to repair itself. So what we see here is that when bone replaces itself or repairs itself, it goes through pretty much the same steps as developing bone. So here is that hematoma, right? Here's that blood clot. And then first thing you do is you actually make cartilage. So the first thing that comes in is cartilage. And then that cartilage becomes vascularized to become bone. And then eventually, it's almost like it's brand new. You really can't tell that anything went wrong with that bone. Under an x-ray, you might see a little bit of thickening on the edges where that fracture was. So you might pick that up on an x-ray, but functionally, that bone will be absolutely fine. Blood will be continuous throughout the bone, just as if nothing had ever happened. If you've ever been to a country where there isn't orthopedic help after someone fractures, you'll see people with very deformed bones. Something broke. They weren't able to get it reset. It did heal, but at a weird, funky angle. And they're, they're stuck with that unless someone goes in and, quote, re-breaks it and resets that bone. Um, I have a, a funky bone in my, in my hand. I was skiing years ago in Colorado and went down weird, and the pole, um, I didn't know it was broken. It hurt like heck for weeks. And my thumb was painful, but I didn't realize it until, you know, a little bit later, I have this big displaced bone right here. So clearly something broke. And so I must have had a meta, what? Metacarpal, right? A metacarpal definitely snapped in there. And I didn't get it repaired. I just thought it was painful. But it must have broken because now I've got this lovely funky bone that pops up. Um, so it healed itself, but at a weird angle. Yeah, so it'll come back. So the, the cells there kind of know what, what the bone's supposed to look like. Now, that's in a normal situation. There are abnormal situations where the bone will heal in a weird way. It'll, it'll overproduce bone and become different in its shape. But most of the time, the bone will just kind of repair itself and look just like it did before the fracture. Say it again. Um, if anything, it could lengthen or it could shorten either, either way, depending upon. Um, typically, if the bone just breaks, it'll be fine. If the bone breaks into many little pieces, then that's not going to heal by itself, right? That's going to require pins and plates and things to bring it all together. But I don't know that it would lengthen significantly. But there could be those weird situations, right, where, because we know some people who have scarring, the scarring 
is excessive, and they get these keloids, they get these raised um, scar tissue. I suppose there could be people who have abnormal bone so that when it regrows, it becomes thicker, bigger, and maybe would elongate the bone just a little bit. But I'm not, I don't know of any particular syndrome or name for that. Bone spurs would be either a little fragment of a bone um, or it could be a little abnormal growth of a bone, little, just like a little piece that sticks out inappropriately. So an overactive osteoblast area. Uh, while we're talking about um, bone, let me tell you about a couple different deformities. Uh, these all deal with spinal, the spinal bones, the vertebra three basic curvature deformities. One is kyphosis. Kyphosis is hunchback look. It is a very exaggerated thoracic curvature. So the thoracic vertebra are going to bend and not be able to straighten back out. I'll show you a picture. Number two, lordosis. Lordosis is down in the lumbar vertebra. This is a, a sway back. Sometimes they'll call it sway back. And this is caused either by pregnancy or obesity. So extra weight on the stomach causes an increase in curvature of the lumbar vertebra, which can lead to some pain going down the back of the leg, the sciatic nerve. We'll make that connection next week in lab. And then scoliosis is a abnormal lateral curvature. So you look at somebody and they look like they have a, a, an S to their vertebra. Most of you uh, were probably screened for scoliosis in public high school gym class. Uh, maybe the PE teacher at middle school, high school had you line up along the wall. Uh, maybe lift your shirt, the school nurse went down. And if they saw any curvature, they might have handed you a piece of paper and said, you know what, uh, we're, we did a screening today. We think maybe your child has scoliosis or early signs of it. Please have them checked out. Um, here's a picture of that. On the left, that is kyphosis. Again, you see that the thoracic vertebra are the ones that have kind of deformed in their shape. And this can become extremely deforming. I mean, this person could be bent over all the way. So you see people with tremendous kyphosis kind of walking and looking at their feet. Then the second one, the middle one, is lordosis. Again, you see the curvature in the lumbar region. This can cause pinching of the nerves that go down the back of the leg. And during pregnancy, women get sciatic nerve pain sometimes. Um, and that's, that's a part of that lordosis, pinching off some of the nerves going down the back of the leg. After you're done being pregnant, then... It, re it repairs itself. Usually that lordosis is temporary. And then here you see that squiggle S. That's the scoliosis, uh, a lateral curvature of the spine. And this can become extremely debilitating and, and very off and really cause some issues. My um, now 20-year-old daughter has a little bit of scoliosis, Probably like this one. No, nah, not this much. She's really affected over here. Not this much. And she's an equestrian. And when we, when we first saw the scoliosis, the orthopedic people gave her a cast to try to sleep in. And it went up on one side of her body, up over her rib cage, and down the other side of the hip. And she was supposed to kind of get into this little box and clamp it down and sleep in it. Well, you can imagine that was very uncomfortable. So she didn't tolerate it very well. It wasn't meant to correct the scoliosis just to keep it from getting any worse. Uh, you really can't fix it. You can just kind of slow down the progression until her body reached its length. It, nowadays, she'll, she'll still complain a little bit sometimes about her back hurting a little bit. But where it really becomes a problem is when she's riding her horses. And she does eventing and dressage as part of that. And she's supposed to be extremely straight up on the horse. Sometimes to get the horse to do his thing, she has to kind of tilt over a little bit because the horse knows that she's off balance and the judge will pick up on it and will say, oh, you're a little bit off center there. And she's, she suffered a few points lost uh, because of her scoliosis, but for the most part, uh, it's pretty well under control. And there's no way to kind of... No way to put it back. And now that she's adult size, it's not going to get worse. So it's only, it can progress during the developing years. So it's during the teenage years, you really want to be careful about it as the body's elongating. Basically, the vertebrae just don't have enough space, right? They kind of get kinked and uh, not much we can do to stop it. Oh, not much we can do to correct it, but we can slow it down and, and stop it from getting worse. Now that's the end of my presentation on chapter, I think my numbers are off. 
six, right? And this should be seven now, right? So this should this is number. I should say number seven. Um, chapter seven in your Martini book is basically name that bone, right? It's, this is the femur. This is the this is the scapula. I'm not going to re lecture on that. That's what we did in lab. Okay, so I'm not going to go through all that. But you do definitely want to know terms like shaft and head and condyle and turbicol and meatus. These are the terms that you've seen. I'm, I'm, in fact, some of these terms are on that take-home quiz that you're doing that's posted in the hallway because these terms are so important. You need to know what a meatus is. You need to know what a, what a process is. You need to know what a sinus and a fossa are. So this will help you as you're learning about pieces and parts of bones. That brings me to the end of that chapter. So like I said, this test is only over three lectures, and I've done just on one of them. I'm not done for the day, but I want to give you a break. Let's have a good break. Let's have a good 12, 12, 12 15 minute break, okay? And we'll come back and we'll pick up on joints. So let's pick up. We finished the chapter on bone. That's one third of exam number three. The second section is on joints. Uh, this is largely taken from chapter eight. There's a few extra things that I'm gonna, that I have thrown into this presentation that are only found in the PowerPoints. And uh, some of this you've seen in lab again this week. So let's start off with the three different types of joints. Remember, a joint is where two bones come together, where two bones articulate, and you've seen these slides already in lab. So there are fibrous joints. These are where two bones come together, but there's little to no movement between those bones. This is going to be your sutures. You know about the coronal suture. The suture is the connector between the frontal and the parietal bones. Another example of a fibrous joint is the ligaments that hold your ulna and radius together, or the ligament that hold your fibula and tibia together. They're not just hanging out side by side. They are connected by ligaments. Those ligaments are more stabilizing. They're not really meant to be moving. So those are also fibrous joints. And then finally, there is the socket of your teeth. Uh, that's called a gomphosis. It's a specific name for how the tooth fits into the bone. And I just think of gum phosis, like my gums, uh, gum phosis. Here is a quick picture of that just to give you a visual. On the top is a suture. Uh, we learned about the coronal suture. There are other sutures on the skull. Again, uh, there's this squiggly line that connects the bones together. Then here is a ligament. Okay, let's, let's quiz ourselves here. White, it's white. What kind of tissue makes up a ligament? It is a connective tissue. It's one of our six. Dense regular, right? Dense regular is what makes up ligaments and tendons. Here, what two bones are being connected by this ligament? The tibia and the fibula. And while we're at it, what's this bone marking right there? Medial malleolus, thank you. Medial malleolus, and this bump down here is the lateral malleolus. So don't make this hard, guys. You know that the fibula is on the outside. It is more lateral. So the bump on your ankle on the outside is the lateral malleolus made by the distal end of the fibula. And the distal end of the tibia on the inside is creating the, ma the medial malleolus. Then there are cartilaginous joints. Yes? So you said that the cartilage cannot be like, reformed when it's dying. Yes. Can joint be like, fragmented? No. What a, like if someone has their knee damaged, there's a big chunk of cartilage in the knee, we'll get to this next semester, called the meniscus. It's a big chunk of cartilage. When it's gone, it's gone. Now, we can go in and surgically repair it if it's been torn, and we can go in and surgically replace it if it's been worn down. That replacement can be artificial, but is sometimes now cadaver. So because it's an avascular tissue, right? It's mature cartilage, it's avascular. We can take a young, health, I shouldn't say a young, healthy cadaver, but we can take, uh, we can take uh, that cartilage from you know, a, young, a young donor and actually put it in there and it doesn't really have any immune response to it because it's a bloodless tissue. So it's, a, it's an option. 
So um, no, but once cartilage is once cartilage is formed, it is avascular and is not repaired. Ligaments and tendons, a little bit of repair, right? Because there's a little bit of blood, but not much. Then there's cartilaginous joints. These are the ones that are connected through a big chunk of cartilage. The easiest one to imagine is the ribs going to the sternum. You know there's that big chunk of cartilage. That is hyaline cartilage that connects those. Also the disc between your vertebra. But again, like we said in lab, most of your joints are synovial. And in lab, I asked you to know three of these six, and the rules have not changed. So I still want you to only worry about hinge, pivot, and ball and socket. Okay, so we've got our two hinge joints. We know elbow and knee. We've got our pivot joint. I described it as the elantoaxial joint. That's the one that allows your head to pivot on the dens of C2. And then there is the ball and socket joints, the glenohumeral joint, and the coxal joint, the shoulder and the hip, respectively. Pretty straightforward, but I'm going to... I'm going to focus more on the bone markings right now as I look at these images with you. So this is the elbow joint. We got that. What is this region called? I know it has cartilage on it because it touches another bone, but what's that region called? I circled it in red. This is the... head of the radius. Head of the radius, just the head. This area here would be the radial tuberosity. And what attaches to that radial tuberosity? Biceps, Biceps brachii muscle, absolutely. Okay. What is this region to which the head of the radius articulates? That round head of the radius articulates with the capitulum of the humerus. Clean this off. What is this U-shaped structure of the ulna? It's good we're doing this. Trochlear notch. And the trochlear notch is going to articulate with a portion of the humerus called the trochlea. Finally, what is the tip of the elbow called? Starts with an O. Olecranon. Okay, it's the olecranon. That's fun, isn't it? That's a hinge joint, right? So we got, what, one, two, three, four, five things to know related to that. Then, question. Would you say that, uh, would a bicep break right here, there's a, a roughened, let me, sorry. Right in this area, there's a roughened area on the radius called the radial tuberosity. Radial tuberosity. Then we've got the pivot joint. The pivot joint I want you to know most about is the elantoaxial joint. This is a fancy word for where the atlas, C1, and the axis, C2, come together. So the atlas is also the name for C1. The axis is the other name for C2. What we see here is this thing sticking up from C2. That is the dens. The other name for that is the odontoid process. I think dens is a whole lot easier to spell, right? But the odontoid process. Now, what we lose sight of in the lab, because we don't have the ligaments, look at this. There is a little ligament that comes across from C1 and holds that dens in place. And that's the pivoting you know, part that we kind of lose sight of when we look at those vertebrae hanging on that string in the box. Now, also on C1, on the atlas, do you see this white cartilage? What is that articulating with? That's the atlas, not the, not the mastoid. 
Those two pieces of cartilage are on C1, right? They're on the atlas. What are they resting on? Not the magnum frame, but the little bumps on each side. The occipital condyles, right? The occipital condyles are those little bumps on either side of the frame of magnum, and it's that, it's those two that are sitting right there on the cartilage of C1. You're beginning to make those connections, right? Why are we learning some of these crazy things? Because they, they really have some important structures. And you'll be able to watch bones and CSI with a whole lot of more appreciation because they use these terms all the time. They do. They use these terms, these bone markings, all the time in their conversations when they're looking at a skeleton. It's kind of fun to watch. Now, the three that you do not need to know, planar, saddle, and condyloid. You don't need to know them. Please don't focus on this. Don't memorize this. But all of these are found in the wrist and the hand. Okay? I'm just not going to go there with you. But they are the kinds of movements between your carpals and between the bones of your hands and of your knuckles. Then there's that ball and socket. This one we do need to know. So let me quiz you also here. This is a lovely place to quiz you. This bone is the what? All of it. Oscoxa. It's made up of the ilium, what you're sitting on, the ischium, and over here, the pubis. Now, on here, let's do some bone markings while we're at it, shall we? This piece of cartilage where the two pubic bones grow together would be referred to as the pubic symphysis. And it's a nice example of a cartilaginous joint where two bones are connected by cartilage. There's an opening here. Foramen. Mm -hmm. Which one? Obturator. It's a new word. Obturator foramen, big opening in the oscoxa. On the back side of the ischium, really not obvious here, but on the back side of the ischium, there's a roughened spot. That is the ischial tuberosity. And what muscle group attaches to the ischial tuberosity? You're in the right area. What group of muscles? Hamstrings. So of the six muscles you need to know, which one was the hamstring muscle? You need the origins insertions. Biceps femoris was one of your six muscles, and it mentions in that list that it attaches up to the ischial tuberosity. What is this bump here? Greater trochanter, lesser trochanter, Narrow region is the neck, the ball is the head, and it fits into a cavity of the oscoxa called the acetabulum. Good. If I were looking at the sacrum from the back side, I would see all those little openings. Collectively, those openings are called the dorsal sacral foramina. If you're looking at them from the front, they're called the ventral dor sacral foramina. Right? But we're only talking about the back one, right? So we've got you on the list, we've got the dorsal sacral foramina. Okay, that's enough of that, right? So every time I see something like this, I'm going to start jumping out bone markings at you. Now, your joints um, go from being very stable, like your sutures, right? Very, very stable to rather loose, like the shoulder and the hip. And you pay a price for that looseness. So the, the ball and socket joints have the greatest mobility, but are also the bread and butter of a physical therapist. And so these are the ones that have the greater stability issues. So this just shows that, that re inverse relationship, that the joints that are most stable, that is the ones that are immovable, like your sutures, are the greatest stable, stability, right? Less mobility, greatest stability. Your glenohumeral joint is actually your least stable joint. 
it kind of makes sense. When you look at the glenohumeral joint, don't you kind of wonder how this thing works? What we've seen from bones is the head of the humerus fits into this little empty space called the glenoid cavity with a couple projections, the acromion and the coracoid process, but it doesn't look very secure, does it? What we don't see are all the ligaments and tendons and muscles that hold all that together. So it is the least stable joint. It has the most mobility, but it has the greatest issue with stability. The next most mobile is the coxal joint. But the head of the femur fitting into the acetabulum, that looks a little bit more supportive, doesn't it? It's a little bit more structural. And it needs to be because that's the joint that carries our weight. So we have to carry our weight on that coxal hip. The elbow is kind of intermediate. It's kind of, you know, we only have one range of one angle or one axis of motion, but we still have quite a bit of motion there. We can do some information or movement in our elbow. And then the discs, those are what kind of, what kind of uh, joints are these? Cartilaginous, right? Cartilaginous joints, which are more movable than fibrous joints. So fibrous are like your sutures. The intervertebral discs are your um, cartilaginous joints. And then these three are, cons are examples of synovial joints, synovial joints. Again, in lab, I talked about these different angular movements. So I introduced abduction, adduction, flexion, extension, hyperextension, lateral flexion, and circumduction. Those are the six or so, seven, that you saw in lab. And the ones that you need to be most familiar with for next week, because they will represent themselves on the lab exam. So make sure you know what those are. Let's review those. What is abduction, abduction? Abstain, go away from. That is moving the body away from basically anatomic position. Fingers, legs, arms, whatever, moving away. A deduction, bringing it back toward the center. Now, in the, in the gym, you go to a Nautilus line, and you're going to see an abductor, adductor machine. Right? You sit in it, and in one position, you, you crank the button, and you have to pull your legs apart with force. What muscles are you using? You're pulling apart. You're, what muscles? You're, you're putting weight, right? And you're going away from so you're using your abductors. And then when you flip the, flip the switch, you start out, and now you're having to pull inward. You're having to use your adductors. Now, where that machine is placed in your gym tells me a lot about what kind of gym that is. OK? This is, this is my test when I walk into a gym. Where is that machine? If that machine's in the front window facing outward, then I know that's the kind of gym I don't belong in. Okay. If, that if that machine's over in the corner, discreetly where it should be, then, okay, I can go there, right? So if it's a meat market kind of gym, right, then that machine's going to be right there by the mirrors and by the front window, right? <laughs> Just think about it. Okay, so where is it at your gym, okay? Now, you saw this picture. Abduction, adduction, all sorts of body parts can be done showing this uh, from jazz fingers, moving your hand, moving your leg, whatever. I apologize, the formatting got a little bit funky on the picture. Uh, you've also seen this one, flexion, right? Flexion is defined by decreasing the angle of the bones, extension back to 180, hyperextension beyond 180. Lateral flexion just simply bending to the side, and circumduction would be taking your finger, your arm, your leg, keeping the proximal end stable, and twisting the distal end in a circular motion. If you break the word down, circum, circular, duct to draw. So leader draw. So we, we know what these terms mean. Now, there are some other ones that we did not do in lab that I want to add to your understanding. Rotational. Simply, it's pivot. It's a, it's a pivot. Now, we, the only pivot I talked about was the elantoaxial joint that allows you to say no with your head. But even I can pivot my arm. Now, where is that pivot motion coming from? up in the shoulder, right? That pivot is coming from the shoulder. Um, I can do the same thing with your leg, right? That pivot motion is coming from the coxal joint. So there are other ways of pivoting. But here are some other kind of special ones. Depression 
in elevation, just as the name suggests. Depression is some sort of inferior movement of the body, basically to drop your shoulders, kind of, you know, droop your shoulders down. That would be depression. And to elevate would be to raise it back up. So to go up on your tiptoes or to raise your shoulders up, that'd be some sort of elevating motion. Dorsiflexion and plantar flexion, these are both dealing with the ankle. They're strange words. Dorsiflexion is the ankle being bent up toward the leg. So everyone try to do dorsiflexion. It's flexion, right? It's flexion. It's actually you're decreasing the angle between your foot and you're bringing your toe up toward your knee, right? But the opposite term also uses flexion in it, which is odd. Plantar flexion. Plantar flexion is toe point. So, you know, straightening your leg out and doing toe point, that is plantar flexion. I don't think the word flexion belongs there, right? Plantar refers to the bottom of the foot. Flexion says the angle is increasing, but when I do plantar flexion, right, I don't see that the way that it, it, the word suggests to me. So you just need to know that plantar flexion. If you've heard of plantar warts, right, don't go to the foot doctor and walk around barefoot because half the people there have warts and you're going to get them too. So always wear socks when you're at the podiatrist. But plantar warts, bottom of the foot, think about that you're doing toe point. Now, a couple other... Um, Types, eversion and inversion, also dealing with the feet. There's a picture coming. Uh, eversion is turning the foot out laterally. Inversion will be turning the foot in medially. There's pronation and supination. In anatomic position, you know that your radius is along the thumb and your ona is along the pinky side of your forearm. When you're in an anatomic position, they are side by side. However, when you flip your palms backwards, those bones cross over each other like an X, okay? So the way I remember this is if I need to get my supper, I need to have my hands out with my hands facing forward, anatomic position. The motion of turning your hand forward to AP, to anatomic position, that is supination. When you flip them backwards, that is pronation. So in my notes, what I'm saying to you is that when you pronate your arm, you're actually causing the ona to cross over the radius as an X. When you supinate and bring the arm back around to anatomic position, the ona is parallel with the radius. Pronation. Pro protraction is coming down later on. Did I misspeak? No. no okay. So pronation and supination. That's where I am right now. Okay. Protraction. Okay. This is a movement anteriorly that is in a horizontal plane. Basically, to protract would be to stick your chin out. Just stick your chin out. That's protraction. To retract it, to bring it back, right? Just to bring it back where it was. Opposition. You may have heard it said that humans have an oppositional thumb. We are able to take our thumb and put it over our palm. Some apes or monkeys, I forget which ones, can't do that. So that's something unique to higher primates and to us. So we can do opposition. What I don't have on here is when you put it back, it's called reposition. <laughs> Not, okay. So opposition, reposition. So let me show you a picture of each of these. So again, I can do rotation or pivot as she's doing in the upper left. That is just pivoting on your lantoaxial joint. You can also rotate, you know, you can even rotate your elbow, arm straight. You can rotate around your, your hip. Uh, so that's rotation or pivot, same thing. Then here are the other ones. Depression, elevation. Depression is kind of dropping your shoulders down, something moving downward. Elevation, bringing it back up. So depression down, elevation up. Here's that dorsiflexion. So going up, dorsiflexion, bringing the ankle up toward the knee, and then doing the toe point, that is plantar flexion. To turn your foot inward is inversion. To take it out is eversion. Supination, pronation. Okay, so again, if you're going to turn the arm such that you can reach for your supper, that is supination. If you flip it backwards, that is pronation. Protraction, 
sticking your chin out, horizontal uh, motion anteriorly, retraction, bringing it back. Opposition, putting your thumb over your hand, reposition, putting it back. So know those. Now, in the days when I had smaller classes, when I used to teach at Wesleyan, I used to have students go out in the hallway during the test, and I would have 12 or 15 of these motions on a card, and they would go out in the hallway and just randomly pick up one of the cards, and I'd say, okay, demonstrate that for me. I can't do that. My classes are too big. So rather than that, I'll test you on these things more through a, uh, a conversation. So if a person is raising their hand and putting it on the back of the couch, what have they just done? Abduction, right, of the shoulder or of the arm. So I'll, I'll just give you a phrase. I'll give you a, a body motion and say, what motion? What's the name of that motion? Okay. Now, the next, I got eight minutes. And in that eight minutes, I'm not going to get through all of these. This is kind of a sit back and watch. I'm going to go through about six different very important joints in your body. There's a lot of information here that you don't need to know, but it will help you make some connections with your bone markings. So the only thing, when I tell you, that's when you have to focus on it. There's some extra information here that you do not need to know. TMJ, temporomandibular joint. Where is that? the jaw, right? Between the temporal bone and the mandible. This is a very complex joint. Do you agree that you can move in many different directions? Side to side, front to back, chewing, right? And with that great mobility comes a lot of instability. So this is the oral surgeon's bread and butter, right? So when people have TMJ issues, and TMJ issues are often, they're more common in women, and they are very common in people who've had orthodontia, especially as adults. Uh, the things are getting shifted around and they can start having some issues. Now, what is this? It's actually two joints in one. It's really two synovial joints sitting side by side. And like we said, you can move in many, many different directions. Here's a picture of it, zoomed in. The dark blue would represent a fluid-filled chamber synovial fluid, synovial membrane surrounding it. The white would be the cartilage, the articulating cartilage at the joint. So what you're looking at is, again, um, this, is, this is like a double joint, right? There's two layers of cartilage and two layers of fluid here. While we're here, though, what is this opening? External auditory meatus. If this thing could go back a little bit further, what is this? Mastoid process. And what is this? It's labeled. Styloid process. So you see where we are, right? We're zoomed in at the temporal bone. Isn't that cute? Okay. So we don't see this in the lab. This is showing ligaments. It's showing dense, regular connective tissue that connects bone to bone. Why in the world does the temporal bone have that skinny little styloid process? Because there's this great little ligament attached to it that helps to stabilize the mandible to the temporal bone. You don't need to know it, right? But I want you to see this. We're learning pieces and parts of this. And up here, you can't even see the joint because it is so well stabilized by some ligaments bone-to-bone -bone connectors. And now we can see it's labeled for us. It says canal here. I want you to know the term meatus. So the external auditory meatus. A little bit about the TMJ. Another joint that I want you to know a little bit more about is the glenohumeral joint. This is the shoulder joint. It is also a head, you know, you know it's a ball and socket joint. And you know specifically that this is the head of the humerus fitting into the glenoid cavity. As I've already said, this is the joint with the greatest range of motion and therefore the least stable. In addition to a bunch of ligaments and tendons, uh, there's a bunch of muscles here. These are the rotator cuff muscles. We won't be naming any of them this semester, but in 106, we'll look at those four rotator cuff muscles, and they are going to help hold that arm in place. 
There's also here something new called a bursa. In the vocab, the term bursa came up, and it meant purse. It's a weird word, but bursa, another way of thinking about it functionally, it's a little gel pack. And I'll show you a bursa in a moment. It's a gel pack-like structure that helps to stabilize and protect a joint structure. So look at this. This is the shoulder. You can't even see the head of the humerus. It's back behind a bunch of ligaments that are holding in this to place. And what you do see, though, is this big blue thing. That is a bursa. So it is like a gel pack. It's like this big fluid-filled gel pack. It can become inflamed. People can have bursitis, a uh, very painful situation. And you can see that um, what's beautiful about these ligaments is they name themselves. Not to learn it, but the coracoacromial ligament must go between what and what? The coracoid process and the acromion process. Okay, so the ligaments, when we get there next semester, we're going to see that they name themselves. It's really a beautiful thing. Not hard. We're now looking at the shoulder in straight in from the, from the side. And I'll finish up with the shoulder and we'll be done. This, I'm seeing cartilage, right? White cartilage. What is that? That cartilage is sitting on top of what we would call the glenoid cavity. And it's there where the head of the humerus is also going to have its own cartilage and is going to fit beautifully up against that piece of cartilage. The blue are those bursa. Okay, so some of those bursa that we saw. And the white are the tendons. And here is actually the tendon of the biceps brachii coming up. And if you go back and look, I told you that the biceps brachii tendon came up and attached where? You remember? In that origin insertion list? It told you that it came up to the uh, greater turbicle area, the big bump on the humerus, and it also mentions coming up to the coracoid process. Here's the coracoid process. And so part of the biceps comes up and attaches to that. Okay, it doesn't show it all here, but that's in that origin insertion list. Again, here's another view of the shoulder. What you're seeing here, again, you've got the head of the humerus. There's that nice, oops, sorry, last slide. Here's that nice piece of cartilage on the head of the humerus. And then there's also going to be a nice piece of cartilage on the glenoid cavity. Fluid in between. So the purple area is a fluid-filled synovial membrane. And the blue is the bursa, these little gel packs that kind of support and protect. And then you can see different tendons coming up and coming around and supporting this important joint. So I've gone through TMJ and shoulder. I really don't have that much left. I think I'll be done. This is kind of scary, but I think I'll be done with the material for exam number three on Monday, which is fine, right? because it's all musculoskeletal. It's going to help you make connections with what's going on in the lab practical. That means that next Wednesday, I'll probably be talking about new stuff that's going on for exam four. We'll start with the nervous system. So that's where we're going to end up today. I'll pick up and continue this conversation with you uh, on Monday. Study well. Do well. Remember that there is that PAL quiz I'm mastering, and there's a quiz that's posted in the hallway that you'll bring back to you, bring back to me when you take the lab practical on Monday or Wednesday, and the pre-lab, or pre-lab six, do not worry about completing it. If it creates a problem for you, you can do pre-lab six during lab next week. So don't feel like you need to do that instead of studying for the exams.